uh, and I'm going to be running this uh, this afternoon session. Uh, so welcome back to the second lecture in the ACA Bionet GWAS lecture series. Uh, we hope that the, the first uh, lecture was useful. And hopefully a lot of you, uh, especially those that are hoping, uh, attending the, the practical workshop later in the year, have already started uh, working with the GWAS pipeline, the HA Bionet GWAS pipeline. And if you haven't, make sure that you do start with that, because that's very important for you to understand before you actually get to, to the workshop. So before we start with today's session, a bit of housekeeping rules first. Um, so first and foremost, when you log on, make sure that you are on mute. So I think everyone has taken a second now to make sure that your microphone is muted. Uh, and, and try and keep that muted throughout the, the talk. Uh, because if we do have feedback from other people, it gets quite distracting. Uh, so make sure that you're on mute throughout the lecture, and we will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, if, you're not here, if you are hearing anything uh, and your audio is not active, you can activate it by clicking on the, on the microphone on the, on the top panel in your browser, and that will activate your, your audio and your microphone. Um, if you do have a question, there is an icon uh, on, the, on the top panel as well, on the, towards the right-hand side, uh, which you can click on, and it'll actually just uh, put a little raise hand. So I've activated it now, so you should see a little raise hand icon next to my name. Um, and then you can put it on. Yep. Um, and then finally, most importantly, uh, at the end of this, this lecture, there will be a URL that will be posted up. Uh, and this is a URL where you have to go and fill out your attendance. So please make sure, again, uh, to the participants who are attending the workshop, uh, the hands-on workshop, this is very important. And we will log uh, your attendance based on you filling out that form. So make sure that you do fill out that form at the end of the, at the, end of the lecture. OK, so I think we can get started. Uh, so moving on in, in our series of lectures, uh, we're very excited and privileged to have Professor Michelle Ramsey with us today to pre present today's lecture, which is uh, providing an overview of genome-wide association studies and study designs. Uh, Professor Michelle Ramsey is the director of the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Biosciences. Uh, and he's a professor in the Division of Human Genetics at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, in South Africa. Um, so her research interests are focused on studying African population genetic diversity and environmental factors to better understand their role in diseases. And uh, she's involved in a lot of different uh, projects, uh, ranging from rare monogenic eye and skin disorders to African population genetics pharmacogenomics, and complex disease traits in African populations. Um, she's also the principal investigator on an NIH-funded collaborative center uh, under the Asia Africa Consortium, which is aimed at identifying the genomic and environmental risk factors for cardiometabolic diseases in Africa. Uh, and this, also, this study also includes a very large GWAS uh, of over 12,000 individuals looking at several different phenotypic traits. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, so thank you again, Michelle, for presenting this lecture. And uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, I just want to check, can you actually hear me? Yes, I can hear loud and clear. Thank you. Perfect, else thank you. So just to say welcome to everybody. Um, I, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to talk to you about genome-wide association studies. And uh, just being reminded at what an interesting time we are at the moment that people are getting their data from the H3 Africa SNP genotyping array and that um, you can now start analyzing your data. But I'm sure that many of you have, have bigger pictures in mind in terms of uh, what you're actually going to be looking at. And of course, each one of you will have your own phenotypes that you'll be interested in. So um, the lecture today is really very much a high level um, sort of view of genome-wide association studies and maybe just to remind ourselves again that 
although the number of studies in the world is increasing very rapidly, there still are fewer data from African populations. So I think through H3 Africa, we certainly are going to be um, increasing the number of studies and the number of participants that are actually involved in genome-wide association studies. So as you can see here um, on the right, those pie charts actually show you um, the number of studies and the number of participants or samples that have been involved in GWAS studies and the difference between 2009 and 2016. So what you will see from those two pie charts is that um, the number of the relative proportion of people of European ancestry has gone down and the proportion of non-Europeans has gone up to 19%. But of the 19%, only 3% is for participants of African ancestry. And so although that has gone up from about a half a percent to 3% during the period of 2009 to 2016, um, it is, it's not enough relative to the proportion of Africans who um, live in the world. So about 16% of the world population is African. And um, just to make the other point is that many of the studies that have African ancestry are African Americans. So now with our studies through H3 Africa, we're actually going to have a lot of data on Africans in Africa. So when we think of um, genetic association, it's, it's really important for us to understand genetic diversity and maybe to look at what are some of the drivers of genetic diversity at a population level. And um, if we think about the genome, it's essentially about demographic history and then about genome evolution that kind of shapes the genetic diversity in populations. So what you can see on the left is that forces in history, such as migration of populations and admixture of populations, contribute quite a lot to genetic diversity in the populations that we see in living today. But then when we think about it, it's not only about migration and admixture that changes, for example, relative allele frequencies between populations. It's also about what is happening. So we know that mutations happen all the time. And with every um, meiotic event and with every new baby born, there's roughly between 25 and 35 new mutations that arrive somewhere in the genome. And of course, most of those mutations will be in non-coding regions because we know that the coding region of the genome is only about 1.8%. So new mutations arise, um, and that adds to genetic diversity. When we get recombination during meiosis, it contributes to genetic diversity, as does random events like genetic drift. And then, of course, in some populations, we have natural selection, and natural selection can also change genetic diversity. Um, for example, the increase of the sickle cell mutation in areas where um, malaria is common. So knowing that those are all the forces that contribute to genetic diversity, what is unique or different about African populations? So we now know for certain that there is higher genetic diversity. So we know that when we do whole genome sequences, and we can say Africans roughly have a third more genetic variance than do non-African populations. But you have to remember, of course, when we're doing a GWAS array, all we're seeing are the variants that are on the array. And depending on how they were chosen, um, more or fewer of them would be monomorphic. So we also know that African populations generally have higher population structure. And for those of you who are working across different African regions, this is going to be very important to understand and then to also take into account when you do your genome-wide association studies. And then lastly, another characteristic of African populations is that there is generally lower linkage disequilibrium, which means that the haplotype blocks are smaller. And this has some very interesting um, advantages in terms of finding causal variants that are identified in GWAS studies. So what we, we can say is that genetic variation contributes to susceptibility for complex traits and to the ability of populations to adapt to their changing environments. And this is, of course, very important because we're seeing a lot of um, environmental changes across the African continent.
So this is how I've decided to structure the lecture. Um, so to talk a little bit about complex traits, um, because those are what we are trying to look at when we do genome-wide association studies. If you were looking at monogenic or Mendelian traits, you would use a different approach. We're then going to talk about the principles of genome-wide association studies, and we're going to talk about study designs, um, and also how you calculate power and the fact that population structure is important. I've just got a few slides about African genome structure specifically, because this is where we are working. And I'm then going to talk about the importance of doing replication studies, because um, I think worldwide people don't want spurious data to go into the journals and become part of the permanent um, record, because that happened in the early days of GWAS. So these days, if you want to publish a GWAS in a high-impact journal, it is imperative that you do a, a replication study in some way or another. And then I'm going to give you a couple of examples to make different points about genome-wide association studies. So when we think about um, diseases in general that affect individuals' populations, we know that almost all diseases have both a genetic component and an environmental component, and that the relative proportion differs depending on what the disease is. So if you look at the top and we look at infectious diseases and you kind of make a horizontal plane there, infectious diseases wouldn't happen if it weren't for the environment, and the environment being a virus or a bacteria that infects a person. There may be a slight host genetic component in that some people will be more susceptible than others to infection by an organism, and that is very important. But by and large, you wouldn't have infectious diseases if it wasn't, well, you wouldn't have it if it wasn't for the environment. Then as we go down and we look at traits that have a better balance or more equal balance between environmental contributions and genetic contributions, that is when we come to a lot of the complex traits like obesity, like type 2 diabetes, and you can think of so many more, because those are traits that have both a strong environmental component, but also some kind of genetic risk. As we move further down to diseases that are almost entirely genetic, we go to the monogenic diseases where a single mutation is enough for you to actually manifest with the disease, irrespective of what the environment is. So a good example there would be cystic fibrosis, could be Duchenne muscular dystrophy, hemophilia. There are a whole host of monogenic disorders. So, um, so when we think about complex traits, it's really about that middle level. So these are conditions that require both a genetic risk and specific environmental triggers before you would actually be diagnosed with this particular disease. So, you know, a lot of people talk about complex traits. Other people refer to them as multifactorial traits. Multifactorial really meaning that there are different factors that contribute to whether you have the trait or the disease or not. So multifactorial would be both genetic and environmental. Then Often people talk about them as non-communicable diseases because they have an element that is not um, or that is genetic. So they can't be communicated from one person to another. They're actually inherited from parents through to their children. And then, of course, many of the complex traits and non-communicable diseases are actually also chronic diseases. And some of those examples are diabetes, stroke, asthma, kidney disease, and there are many more. So generally, for these complex traits, it's not very easy to estimate the heritability. And um, there's a whole field of research around trying to see how best to estimate that. And sometimes, um, you know, if you use different ways to estimate heritability, you come up with the same figure. Sometimes you come up with very different figures. But more and more, um, now that we're gathering more data, we can actually estimate heritability much better. So the heritability is really the genetic contribution to the trait. And then what we want to do is we want to say for a particular trait, can we actually determine the genetic risk of a person? Because you must always think of this as a spectrum across the population, that some people will have a relatively low genetic risk and other people will have a very high genetic risk, but the majority of the population will probably have an intermediate genetic risk for a particular trait.
And what is very important is that if you have a family member who has a particular complex trait, then your risk for that trait goes up quite dramatically because what it's saying is that you're already, um, just by, by virtue of the fact that you related to them, have a higher chance of having more high-risk variants. So now we go on to um, the general principles for genome-wide association studies. And I think many of you have seen these slides before. So the purpose of a genome-wide association study is really to identify genetic associations to complex traits using markers throughout the entire genome. So again, if you think about the fact that your associated markers is almost like your key that you've dropped in the street. And if you're only looking at one genetic marker, trying to find your key, where that one genetic marker is like the light, um, unless your key is directly under the light, you're not going to see it. Um, so this is where the key is there. And then um, what you do in genome-wide association studies is that you actually have markers throughout the entire genome so that you're lighting up that entire street and therefore you will be much more likely to identify the markers that are associated with the disease. So you should be able to see them. So this is the power of genome-wide association studies is that you literally have markers across the entire genome and one by one you're looking to see whether they are associated with your particular disease. So to do genome-wide association studies, we need to understand a little bit about patterns of genome sequence variation. And therefore, um, many years ago, I think HapMap is more than 10 years ago now, these big international studies were set up to actually identify genetic variation and also to look at patterns of variation in different populations. And I think everybody is familiar with HapMap and with the Thousand Genomes Project. And we've all used that in our studies, often for comparative analyses. And um, you know, when we look at the Thousand Genomes Study, which is about whole genome sequences, um, that beautifully illustrates, again, that African populations have relatively more variants per individual than do non-African populations. So those studies have really been pivotal in teaching us about differences um, between populations, African, non-African, Asian, and so forth. So to enable a genome-wide association study, we now need high-throughput genome technologies. So um, in 2005, when the very first very large GWAS was done, um, we thought we had an extraordinarily powerful technology. And the array then was about 600,000 variants. Now many people use arrays that have two and a half million variants or five million variants. And um, what it means is that if you can have more markers for the same size of the genome, the markers will then be closer together and will be tracking or giving you insights into more regions of the genome. So this has been really important. And um, I'm sure at some stage you're going to have a lecture on um, choice of arrays and specifically the H3 Africa array and how it was decided what content to give it in terms of um, the SNPs or the single nucleotide variants or polymorphisms that were put on there. Because what you really want to do when you develop an array is you want to represent the common variation in a population. Because if you only have very rare variants, they will have very little information and very little power to find associations. So in the design of the H3 Africa array, it was all about identifying more common variants in African populations to actually put on the array. So the two main technologies that are used are either Illumina or Affymetrix. And as you all already know, that um, the H3 Africa array is on the Illumina pa uh, platform. OK, we must have lost something there. Um, but I'm sure that's not a problem. Oh, it is actually quite an important slide that we've lost. Um, I don't think if it's not there now, it's not going to be there. So what the slide that is missing actually shows is that um, you know how you look at a case control study when you do a genome-wide association study. 
in that it's not that the variant that is associated with the disease is only present in the cases. It will be present in both the cases and the controls. And often the frequency difference is subtle. For example, um, in the cases, a particular variant may be present in about six, uh, 25 percent of the um, the chromosomes, but in the controls it may be 15 percent. So the difference that you're looking for there is just a 10 percent different, but that can be highly significant. And that is why we're saying it's an association rather than a causal effect, and that is really important when you're looking at genome-wide association studies. So the slide that we have up at the moment um, really talks to the three different stages of genome-wide association studies on the left-hand side. So the very first stage would be detecting your association, finding that a particular allelic variant at a locus is more common in your cases than it is in your controls, or the other way around. And that is really the very first step. But once you've detected an association, as I mentioned earlier, you then want to replicate that association in an independent um, data set. And eventually, if you want to understand more about the underlying biology of the association, it's really important to be able to identify a causal variant, because that will then um, give you some insight into how that change actually impacts on the phenotype. So what I've done in this slide is to um, look at some of the pros and cons of using European populations versus African populations. And when you look at the very top line, what is the impact in terms of detecting your association in the first place? So in European populations, you generally have high linkage disequilibrium, which means that the haplotype blocks are larger. And that if you have a variant that is in linkage disequilibrium with the causal variant, you will actually be able to use the first variant to detect your association. And it doesn't matter that they're quite far apart from one another. In an African population, the situation is different. Because there is lower linkage disequilibrium, your haplotype blocks are small. And if your causal variant is on a haplotype block that is not represented by a variant that is in your array, you could completely miss the association. So it reduces your likelihood of detecting the association in the first place. But I think we're fortunate now that we are using so many different markers that you know, the likelihood is that we would be tagging all the haplotypes or the majority of haplotypes even when we use African populations. So in African populations, you need more single nucleotide variants on your array to cover all the haplotypes or LD blocks. So when we now go to replication, in European populations, your chance of replicating is pretty good, even if you don't have the causal variant, because of the higher linkage disequilibrium. However, if you're looking at an African population, the replication may not be so good if you are not very close to your causal variant or looking at your causal variant itself. And then eventually, when we get to the last step, which is trying to localize the causal variant, there we have an advantage in African populations in that you are likely to be much closer to your causal variant because of the low linkage disequilibrium and therefore would be able to, to find the biology more quickly. So those are some interesting differences. So this is a typical workflow for a genome-wide association study. Um, so the very first thing you need to do is to look at your biological question and then to see how you would design your study to answer the question. So if, for example, you want to find genetic associations to a particular disease, then you would be looking at a case control study where your cases would be your individuals who have the particular disease and your controls would be people who are disease free for that particular disease. So one example is diabetes. So you would have people who have diabetes and people who do not. And you would then look at allele frequencies and see how they differ within the case group compared to within the control group. 
So that would be your typical study design. Sometimes in genome-wide association studies, we actually want to look at genetic variants that are related to quantitative traits. So that could be, for example, height, or it could be genetic variants that go with your low-density lipoprotein cholesterol or LDL cholesterol. So we'd say, you know, when we look at a population, we know there are people who have very low cholesterol, people who have the average, and some who have very high cholesterol. And what we'd like to know is, what are the genetic variants that contribute to giving people high cholesterol? Because we know that high cholesterol gives you an increased frequency of or increased likelihood of getting something like um, a stroke. So, so that would be very important. So your study design essentially would fall into one of these two categories. Either it's the case control or it is this quantitative trait or quantitative variable that you're trying to find genetic association with. Then once you've designed your study and you've collected your samples, you've um, extracted your DNA and you're now ready to go, um, you need to, to think about what SNP genotyping array would be most appropriate for your study. And um, one of the things you would think about is how many SNPs are there on different arrays that will make you choose one above another? And then what about the content of the array? Um, how would that be most appropriate for your study? And so working in Africa, we generally had the disadvantage that many of the arrays were designed to capture common variation in, in non-African populations. So this is why it's such an advantage to be able to use the H3 Africa array that has specifically been enriched for common variation in African populations. And it is an array with about uh, 2.3 million SNPs. So again, it will cover a lot of the genome and should cover the majority of the LD blocks or haplotype blocks. Um, before you start a study like this, you obviously have to look at things like power. How powered is your study to actually identify an association? And that will depend on a number of things. So it'll depend on the sample size, it'll depend on allele frequency, and it will also depend on the effect size. Like what contribution will a variant make to increasing or decreasing a variant or um, giving you a likelihood of being a case or a control. Um, so the first three are really all about, you know, sort of understanding the study and designing the study. And then eventually when you have all that in place and you've actually done your, um, your actual experiment and you've got all your GWAS data, you then want to do your actual GWAS analysis. And if you have a case control study, you'll be doing logistic regression and you will get an odds ratio. When you're looking at a quantitative trait, you'll be doing linear regression and um, there your measure of effect size will actually be by looking at beta values. And I'm sure you're going to go into a lot of detail here as you apply the GWAS pipeline developed um, through BioNet and H3Africa. So uh, once you've done that and you start getting interesting signals and associations, you want to follow them up. And of course, you're going to be looking for things that are most significant, i.e. have the lowest p-value. And then you're going to want to see, do they have any function? And um, can we get any insight into whether they are genes of interest for the uh, specific phenotype? Um, or can we identify an enrichment of alleles in genes and pathways that are linked to our phenotype. And then, of course, uh, we have to do the replication studies. So I guess one could argue after the GWAS, maybe you should first do your replication study before you start following up your interesting associations. So that might be the other way around. But the replication study is really about doing it in an independent um, group or cohort. Um, again, one would have to think if you want to replicate do you need the same sample size that you had for your discovery? Or can it be smaller? What effect size might you expect? And um, you have to make sure that you're also looking at a similar population when you're doing your replication study for the reasons that I mentioned previously. So this is just to give you some idea of what's been happening in the world. And 
um, as of April 2018, in the GWAS catalog, which is now housed at EBI, um, there were over 5,000 studies, over 3,000 papers, and almost 70,000 genetic associations with a trait or a disease. So you can see that the world has been really busy. Most of these studies have been done in European populations, and we are just so looking forward to getting some studies on African populations that will contribute and possibly give us novel insights. So um, when we think about a genome-wide association study, this is really a non-hypothesis-based study. Because the only hypothesis that we have is to say that we know that there's a genetic component to whatever the disease or the trait is, but we're not presupposing that it is anything specific so we're really going in there with no hypothesis. We're saying we want to look at the entire genome and we want to look for associations. So it's very exploratory. And that's why it's often thought of as being the first step, not the last step of your research project. So I think you know it's an expectation that we sometimes have that once we've done our GWAS, we're almost done with our study. But it really is only the very first step. So when we do... A GWAS, it's really about examining genetic associations with a phenotype. And the genetic markers are, in this case, single nucleotide polymorphisms or variants that are distributed throughout the genome. So because we're doing so many individual tests, you can imagine if you have 2.3 million SNPs and you're doing so many tests, you have to look at your significance value because you have this problem of multiple testing. So you can't have a P cutoff of 0 0.05 because then you will have literally um, tens of thousands of variants that will appear significant, but most of those will be false positives. So that's why in genome-wide association studies, we generally say that your p-value needs to be something like 5 times 10 to the minus 8 or smaller for you to say that this is really genome-wide significant. What we do know is that when we get associations, they seldom the actual causal factor. It's usually a variant that's in linkage disequilibrium and segregating together with the, the causal factor. So people often talk about direct versus indirect association, where a direct association would be if you actually have identified the causal variant. An indirect would be if the marker that you're looking at is hitchhiking or segregating together with the causal variant. In terms of sample size, if you have a relatively small sample size, you may miss important genetic determinants that have a minor effect on the phenotype. So it's really important when you write your papers after you've done your association studies to very carefully word um, what your outcome or your conclusion is based on what you were powered to identify. If, for example, you're doing a replication study and you do a power calculation and you are not 80% powered to find the association, it's not really a very good study to do because if you get a negative answer, it may still be a false answer. So when you have a larger sample size, you are powered to detect smaller effects. And very much in GWAS, um, the bigger the sample size is, the more associations you will find, but very often many of those will have very small effects on the phenotype. So this just brings us back to our two options. The quantitative trait, um, where the effect is measured as a beta value. The higher the beta value, the bigger the effect. And your case control studies, where you've really put all your individuals into two groups, your cases and your controls. And then you're looking at an odds ratio. So I've just made a little note there to say that um, sometimes even defining a case is not entirely clear. And this is why we work so closely with our clinical colleagues, is because we need to understand, you know, what is the cutoff that actually defines a person as being in one group or the other. And sometimes that cutoff is not very clear. So it's very important to understand your phenotype very well and know what its limitations are um, in terms of certain 
um, diseases. For example, in diabetes, if you're looking at very young people, um, you may not know whether they would di develop diabetes later on in their lives or not. And therefore, if you were doing a study, you may want to um, look at older people, um, or you may want to have very definite and clear um, diagnostic criteria for putting people into the cases and the controls. So when you have an odds ratio of one, it means that there's no effect, there's no difference um, in the risk of getting a particular disease from the general population. When you have an odds ratio of 1.1, it means that it has a small effect or whatever the association is contributes a little bit towards increased risk for being a case or having the disease. When you have an odds ratio of two, that's a much larger effect. And obviously, the bigger that is, the, the larger the effect. So um, what is very interesting is sometimes when you do these experiments um, and you look at what comes out of it, you might get an odds ratio less than one. And what it's telling you then is that it is actually not the rare variant that is associated with risk for the disease, but that it is the common variant that is associated with disease. So the rare variant, therefore, goes with the lower risk. So don't be surprised if you get a value less than one. That is the explanation. And what people are doing in many publications now is that um, when they want to, for example, develop a polygenic risk score, is that they would, they would flip the alleles so that all the odds ratios are greater, greater than one. But sometimes the allele that they're looking at is then the common allele and not the rare allele in a particular population. So more and more people are beginning to talk about the genetic architecture of complex traits. And what determines that architecture is a whole bunch of different things. So we would say, you know, the genetic architecture of height might be very different to the genetic architecture of diabetes. Um, so what determines those differences? So one is the percentage of the phenotypic variation that can be explained by genetic susceptibility. So if you have a genetic risk score, how much does it contribute to the probability of developing that particular disease? The architecture can also be dependent on um, the frequency of the variant that is associated with disease. And, and very often you have common variants associated with common diseases. And then some people have identified rare variants that have a bigger effect on a particular disease, but is maybe not present in so many people um, in the population as a whole. So of the examples that I'll give at the end, you will see that one of them is really about um, a rare variant in the rest of the world that's more common in some parts of the world and then has a bigger effect. So when you think about the architecture of the complex trait, that gets taken into consideration. Then linkage disequilibrium is very important and whether you have direct or indirect um, associations. And then when you find associations, how much do they contribute to the trait? So for example, um, if individual associations have small effects, but you know that it's a trait that's highly heritable, then you would have many contributing variants to that particular trait. If there's a large effect, it may be a few variants that are each contributing quite a lot to explaining the variation in the phenotype. But more often than not, there's a sort of a combination of variants that have a small effect and that have larger effects. So for many traits, we see that there are a few core high effect variants and many small effect variants. And there is now this hypothesis that there's an infinite number of variants that may be associated with a particular complex trait. Um, and that the further you go, the smaller each one contributes to that particular phenotype. So if you have a trait where there are a few core things and not that many small ones, that is part of its architecture. Or if you have another trait where there are just many, many, many um, variants that each have a tiny effect, that is also describing the architecture of that particular complex trait. So now I'm going to go to just talking a little bit about power and GWAS. So power is the statistical likelihood or the probability that you can actually detect a real association. The things that influence power, I've already said, are sample size, 
effect size and allele frequency. So when you do a study, you want to be at least 80% power to detect an association, because if your power is less, then it may not be worth doing. So it's really important to understand what you are power to see at 80% in your particular study. Oh, we've lost another slide. Um, let's see, let's go on to the next one. Oh, okay, so we've lost a couple of slides, but I think this one will make do the point nicely. Um, so this is really looking at, so the two slides that we've lost are actually on case control studies, um, but this makes the point too. So this is about a quantitative trait. So what we're looking at here are beta values, and the beta values, so each of the lines represents a different beta value. So the one at the bottom is 0.1, the next one up in the red is 0.2, and then 0.3, etc. So what you have on the vertical axis is the power. So you can see the 80% power, and that's what you're aiming to have. And what you can see on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, is the number of individuals in your study. So that goes from 5,000 up to 55,000 in this case. And the difference between the graph on the left compared to the graph on the right is that for the graph on the left, you have a minor allele frequency, or MAF, of 0 0.05, whereas at, on the right, you have a minor allele frequency of 0.2. And what you can immediately see when you compare the two graphs, knowing that the colors represent the same effect sizes, is that when you have a higher allele frequency, you're going to be more powered at a lower number of um, participants. So that is why the more participants you have, the more powered you are. Okay, you can see it shifting towards the right. But also the higher your allele frequency is, the more powered you will be to actually see the effect. And then, you know, what you can see is that if the effect is large, like if you look at the top there and you take, for example, the green line, which is um, 0.3, you will be more likely to see a beta value of 0.3 than of 0.1 if you have a small sample size, because you can look now at the 80% power. So for example, um, if your effect size is 0 0.03 with a sample size of um, about 12,000 individuals, you will be 80% powered with a, a minor allele frequency of 0 0.05 to find the association. So this is um, really important. So how do we visualize the outcomes of our genome-wide association studies? Um, so I'm assuming that all of you have seen many, many Manhattan plots, where on the x-axis you have the chromosomes from 1 to 22, where each dot represents a single, um, single nucleotide polymorphism or variant, and where the y-axis is actually telling us about the log of the p-value. So if you're looking at a genome-wide association study, you would then see your dotted line um, going across, showing you what is above the significant range. So that would be 5 times 10 to the minus 8. Um, so you can see in this particular example that there are very strong signals on chromosome 5, on chromosome 6, on chromosome 8, 12, and 19. Um, so this would be something we would be really excited and elated about because it's telling you that there are many strong associations with whatever the trait was. So we feel that we have more confidence when we see the towers. Because of linkage disequilibrium, you expect multiple SNPs on the same LD block or haplotype block um, to show the association. So this would be a very good outcome. If you have a Manhattan plot and you have isolated single SNPs above your significance line, um, you may be a little weary that there may be an error, possibly a technical error, in the ability of the array to actually genotype that particular SNP. And that's why I'm going to show you in the next slide why it's important when you see associations to actually make sure that the data is really good. So what we often do once we've done a Manhattan plot is that we want to then hone in on the region of interest, and that is when we use our local zoom plots. So on the bottom graph, you're literally now saying, I'm only interested in the signal on chromosome 4, 
um, obviously a different example. And I want to see um, what is the LD structure of the variants that I'm looking at, and is there more than one variant that's actually tracking with the disease or um, is associated with a particular phenotype that I'm interested in. So this is, a, again, a great result because you can see that there are multiple um, variants that are highly associated with your trait at a very small p-value. And when you look at the linkage disequilibrium, which is the color code on the right, which says R squared, if that is very high between them, then you know that you are tracking probably a single causal variant with a whole number of other variants that are in linkage disequilibrium with your causal variant. So again, this is a picture that would give you confidence that it's real. If you had a single variant that happened to reach genome-wide significance and nothing else underneath it, um, as I said, you want to go and check out that it's real. You may be lucky in that you've hit on the causal variant, but that is unlikely. So it is really important to interrogate the um, result very carefully. So this is what you would do if you want to make sure that whatever is associated actually had good genotype data. And this is when you would look at the genotype clustering. So Lumina has software, I think it's called the Beat Express, which you can then use to look at the outcome of a particular SNP that is associated. So what you will see in the left-hand graph at the top is that there are three very definite clusters, the green, the blue, and the red cluster. So the green cluster would be fluorescing one color only, which means that it's, those are homozygotes for the one allele. And the red would be fluorescing only the other color, which would mean that it is homozygous for the other allele. Whereas the blue on the horizontal, uh, on, the on the diagonal, would say that it's fluorescing both the colors for both of the alleles, and therefore those are your heterozygotes. So that is a, a beautiful um, genome clustering. You would have high confidence in the typing there. And looking at it in a different way below, again, you would see your three definite clusters on the left, homozygous for the one allele, in the middle, heterozygote, and on the right, homozygote for the other allele. But occasionally you see funny things or odd things that don't make sense. So on the right there, you see a block which only has green and blue, but no red. And that tells us that there's definitely something wrong. So this is not a good genotyping cluster. So if that were the marker that showed highly significant associations with your trait, um, it is probably an artifact. So it is very important to go back and look. So, you know, we use as one of our... Um, QC measures in genome-wide association studies, we use Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And already looking at the clustering on the right, that might well have been thrown out by the cutoff that you use for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Because if you have so many apparent heterozygotes, meaning the blue ones, then you would expect at least a few homozygotes. And there are no red dots in that particular graph. So again, just a very important thing to check in terms of your genome-wide association study signals. So what expectations can we have from genome-wide association studies? So if we have a modest sample size, uh, we can use that to do replication studies or to examine previous associations and test for similar effects. And because that would be hypothesis-based, we could probably take a much lower or a much um, less significant p-value. If we had a modest sample size, we could also detect novel associations, but generally those would be large effect associations. And if we have very high sample sizes, we can discover novel associations that even have modest to small effects. So, um, so what we really want to do is to uh, explore insights into the biology and to see what impact African studies can bring to science. So these are some of the things you can think about. So when you are doing your studies, you're looking at your power, you're looking at your sample size, you have to think about you know, what it is that you really want to um, test or be able to see. So let's just look a little bit at African um, 
population structure and how do we take into consideration ethnic differences in GWAS studies and why does it matter? So one of the issues is population stratification. And as I said in the beginning, if you do have a study where your participants come from very different regions in Africa, it's going to be very important to look at population stratification. Um, so what one might find um, if you are doing studies across populations is the same SNP may have a different effect size in a different population, or a SNP may be associated in one population but not another. And you know, that could be due to something like linkage disequilibrium, that your SNP is not on the same haplotype block in all of the population. So that's very important to look at. Um, so again, we've spoken about the appropriateness of having markers that are common in African populations. And um, what we have to bear in mind is that if we don't correct for population structure, we may have a very high false discovery rate. And you're going to learn a lot about QQ plots and how when you incorporate um, population structure based on principal component analysis, you can actually um, reduce your false discovery rate. So that's going to be a very important process that you're going to go through as you do your analysis using the pipeline. So we know that different chromosomal backgrounds in a study population can influence the ability to detect associations. And um, what is great now that we're beginning to have appropriate reference, reference panels is that we can do imputation after we've done our genotyping. So when you do your genotyping, you just get information on each of the SNPs that you have tested. But when you do imputation by using whole genome sequences from a reference population, um, you can then impute additional markers so that you're almost doing like an electronic or in silico fine mapping so that you end up by extending your data and having many more predicted um, genotypes across your genome so that you then also increase your chances of finding associations or find stronger associations than what you would if you only used your array SNPs. So again, it's, it's wonderful that we're at a stage now that we have so many excellent reference panels because that wasn't always the case. And now we can even impute fairly rare SNPs very well. So your, your SNPs could go from your 2.3 million, 2 million right up to maybe 10 or 15 million SNPs once you've done your imputation. So this principal component analysis um, shows you actually a real study that was done where this was a case control study. And um, if you look on the right hand side, if you see SCO, those are the controls. And then for the fourth one down on the right, it says SCA, and those are the cases. And if you look at your controls and your cases, you can see that they actually form a very nice tight cluster. But what you will see is in the dotted circle is that there are a number of individuals who were cases who in fact didn't cluster where the controls were. And in this particular study, we actually excluded those individuals before we did our case control study because they might have influenced um, the association somewhat. So that was very important. So if you are going to be doing a case control study, when you have your GWAS data, one of the first things you should do, and I know that the, the QC pipeline actually does that, is look to see whether your cases and your controls cluster together. So having said that, um, you know, the question is always, do you then exclude people or do you use a method of analysis that can accommodate uh, the different genetic backgrounds? So I think more and more there are now methods of analysis that you can use. Um, they're called Gemma. Um, there's another one called Bolt LMM that can be used to adjust for population structure. But it is a good idea to be able to see uh, what is actually happening in terms of your cases and controls. So this is just highlighting um, the advantages of studying African populations. So if you do your genome-wide association study at the top, where you have your actual markers, 
what you will see is that, so this is like a local Zoom plot equivalent, is that you see that you have many markers in the European population with a very small p-value um, saying that they're highly associated, whereas in your African population, there's nothing that is a really tiny p-value and you might not have looked at this uh, region all that carefully. But if you then do the fine mapping, which we used to do experimentally, but which we can now do by imputation, is you will then see that in the European population, you have a very long stretch of your chromosome where there are highly associated markers. So you don't really know where your causal variant is. But when you look at the right-hand side, and you look at your African population in terms of the fine mapping, you can see a very clear tower and one single very highly significantly associated marker. So this is the advantage of studying African populations is that you can get closer to where the actual variant is. And that's really important if, for example, in that area you have multiple genes, then in the European population you wouldn't know which the gene was that was actually associated with the disease. But in, in the African population, you could be much clearer in terms of what you're actually looking at in terms of association. So now moving over to replication. So um, when we do replications, it's very important that you have an independent sample. So some people, if they have a very large study, may, before they start doing their analysis, say, we're going to use 75% of our samples as our discovery and then we're going to use 25% as our independent uh, replication study. That's, that you can do. Or you can say, in terms of power, I have to use my entire study um, for my discovery, and then you need to find an independent data set from a collaborator or somebody else somewhere in the world um, to actually do your replication. So. Once you're doing the replication, you already know what your effect size is that you're looking for, you know what your allele frequency is, so you can then work out what would be the appropriate size of your replication study to be well-powered to detect it, so that's really important. Then the other important thing to think about when you're doing replication studies is that you must be looking at the identical phenotype. So you can't, um, for example, compare... Um, LDL in one study and total cholesterol in another and say I'm comparing lipids, you actually have to make sure that you're looking at the same phenotype. And likewise, if it was diabetes, for example, you'd have to make sure that the definition of diabetes was the same across the two studies. And then um, you may look for similar effects. So um, you often would see effects maybe not with the identical SNP, but with SNPs in the same region or linkage disequilibrium block. So it's very important um, that you don't just do your replication with your single sentinel or most highly significant SNP, but that you then also look at other SNPs around it, because it may be that your replication population has just a different frequency of the particular SNP that came up in your discovery. Um, so you need to kind of think about replication a little bit more broadly than just a single SNP in one region. And then what is also important to look for is that if you do see an effect with the same SNP in different populations or different studies, um, you need to make sure that they're actually giving you effect in the same direction, that it is the same allele in both of the studies that's actually associated with your um, trait. So this was a lovely review in Nature, published in 2017, just telling us how many studies there are now that literally each have tens of thousands of participants. So what you can see here is that um, if we look at studies between 10,000 and 50,000, there are over 200 of them in the world, and H3Africa will have a similar one once they pull the data from six different studies that have all looked at elements of cardiovascular disease, but that they're just a handful of studies that have more than 200,000 participant, 200, participants. But what we know in general with genome-wide association studies is that they explain only a small fraction of the heritability of a trait, and most of the associations that we find are in regions of the genome that actually don't have a known function. So that makes it really difficult to look at um, the biological significance 
of the associations that you find. So once you find your associations, there's a lot of work that lies ahead to really understand what they mean. I don't know if you want to pause a little bit, Sean, um, for some questions before I go into the examples. Do you want to just guide us here? I don't know if people are getting a little bit tired and need something else. Uh, we can. I think I think we can just uh, pause and see if there are any questions that people want to 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 ask. Thanks. So, yeah, so he's putting been, up some. He's been answering nice some of the questions as we go. <laughs> for us to look at. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I haven't really watched that box. <laughs> should it be by? So I don't know if you have any questions or whether we should just. Um, I see Mazine is asking which is easier to detect by GWAS analysis: low minor allele frequencies or high minor minor allele frequencies? to detect phenotype associations. So you're always better powered when the minor allele frequency is higher. So if you go back to the power plots, what you will see is that if your minor allele frequency is very low, very few people are going to have it. So that there's going to be less ability to look at differences between your cases and controls because fewer people will be informative. So you are more likely to find an association if you have a modest sample size, if the allele frequency is higher. So what we try to do in the development of the H3 Africa SNP array is to try and choose um, SNPs where the minor allele frequency is higher, where the common, it's common variation in the population, because that does give more power. So the question that Wisdom is saying, um, it's true that the minor allele frequency is different per population, and that is just what it is. But you will be more powered if it's higher. So if you have two different populations where you're doing an association, and in one the allele frequency is higher for a particular variant, you will be more likely to see an association if, it is, if there is an association in the one in the population that has a higher frequency for that particular SNP. And um, let's see. I'm not quite sure. Anoja, yes, I agree. Um, and then can GWAS studies be compared to other genomic studies? So I'm not quite sure what you have in mind. Um, so GWAS is particularly about finding associations and with complex traits, because if your genomic study is really about finding mutations for monogenic uh, diseases or Mendelian diseases, you would use a different approach. You wouldn't use a GWAS. And um, sometimes people use family studies also when they're looking at complex traits and then the analysis is, is quite different. So um, Lissedi, I've just missed that, just want to look at that question again. Um, can you just put that question again in the box, sorry, Lissedi's question. So she's, she's asking is, is um, low, low risk variant I think I've lost it now. the same as saying the variant is protective? So no, so either the common or the rare variant can be protective. And you will see that, you know, when you do your association study in terms of what, say, the odds ratio shows. So for example, if your odds ratio is less than one, it means that the common allele is giving you increased risk for your trait or your disease. When the odds ratio is above one, it means that the rare variant is associated with increased risk for the disease. So it's very important that you understand that because sometimes if it is a common disease in the population, it may actually be the common allele that is predisposing you. But remember, in, in any complex trait, you can't look at a single SNP and 
draw a conclusion. You've got to look at many different SNPs because together they contribute more to your phenotype. Individually, they contribute very little. So I think, let's see, are there more questions? Is there a difference between replication and validation in GWAS? Hmm. That's quite an interesting question. So I think replication is if you can do it again. I think validation is just making sure that it's right. So sometimes validation would mean that you um, then would type your SNP again using a different technology. Um, but replication is if you can show it in an individual data set that it's actually replicating. Sean, I don't know if you have another view there. No, I think I, I agree. I agree with what you said. I, I think the, the validation is validating that you can actually biologically get that SNP typed in the experiment. And then the replication is replicating the finding of that association in an independent sample. Right. So part of the validation would be making sure that your genotype clustering is good and perhaps taking a proportion of your individual and using Sanger sequencing to show that you get the same genotypes as you got on your array. So that would be validation. Uh, should we run next-gen sequencing as validation? You can, definitely, um, but you may use Sanger sequencing instead because if you're validating um, you know, if you did NGS, it might be very expensive. But if you did regional capture and next-gen sequencing, that would be a completely valid way of doing validation. Thanks, Wafa. Great. So I think maybe yeah, I should I go on to fine. the examples now. We'll come, we can come back to some of these questions. We'll try and okay. put them on. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, I've got three examples for you. So one is a not very large study, but it shows an association that has a large effect. And the other one is a very large study of blood pressure and shows you that you have many, many variants that each contribute a small effect or a small bit to the variability of the trait. And then we're just going to talk about this whole issue of, um, you know, genome-wide association studies gives you insight into genetic risk, but what about everything else piled on top of it if you take more of a systems biology approach? So this is the first study that was published in Nature Genetics in 2016. And um, what is known is that Samoans have um, one of the highest rates of obesity in the world. And this is partly due to a founder effect. So they're a relatively small population live in somewhat isolation and have this high level of obesity. So the genome-wide association study in this case, um, the discovery study was just over 3,000 individuals and the replication study was 2,000, so it was smaller. And they used um, BMI as a quantitative trait to actually track obesity. So what they found was a very high association. As you can see, the p-value there was 10 to the minus 20 for a particular missense variant, and what was nice there is that a missense variant already says it changes an amino acid, so it may have a real effect. And it was in this gene called GREBRF. And what they, they saw when they looked at this variant was that, in fact, here, the minor allele frequency in Samoans was 0.295. But this particular variant is completely rare or even absent in other populations, which is why nobody else had ever found this, because in their populations, this particular variant wasn't polymorphic. So that is very important, and that is why they could make this discovery in Samoans, but not in anybody else. So the effect size was that um, for every copy of the risk allele, the person had a BMI that was between 1.36 and 1.45, uh, BMI units higher. So, um, so again, you know, when we look at the risk alleles, you could you could have one or you can have two. So this is an additive model. So if you had two risk alleles, then your 
average BMI for people in that group would be higher. And what this brought them was, was really very interesting biological insight in that they showed that in cell models, that if this, if this variant was overexpressed, those particular cells would selectively decrease their energy use and increase their fat storage. So you can see that that would lead to people being more obese. And what they concluded and what they put in their title was that this supports um, that this allele is common in that population because of the thrifty variant hypothesis. <clears throat> so what it's really saying is that if there are very low resources, there might be famine, um, there would not be a lot of food, that people who were either heterozygote or homozygote for this allele variant would have a better chance of survival because they would be decreasing their energy use and increasing their fat storage, even if they had very few resources and very little food. So this is really very interesting because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a novel population. It's a variant that's not present in other populations. It has a large effect and it has a beautiful biological story um, to explain how this could contribute to obesity. So this is what the Manhattan plot looked like on the left. And you can see one very clear, very strong signal that is supported by a bit of a tower indicating that there are other markers and linkage disequilibrium with this variant. And on the right, when you look at the Loka zoom plot, you can see that those three very highly associated variants are all on top of the CRE BRF gene. Okay. And the one that is the missense mutation was the one that they then modeled in the cellular model to see what the effect was of having that variant. You can see that there's another cluster of association off to the right under the um, NKX2 gene. And I'm not quite sure why that was showing an association, but the color suggests that those markers were also in linkage disequilibrium with the three red ones. So, so this is a, a beautiful outcome. And, um, you know, although they started off looking at associations with BMI, their title wasn't genetic associations with BMI and Samoans. Because they had a biological story, they could go to um, a very specific title saying a thrifty variant in this gene strongly influences body mass index in Samoans. So very often we only figure out how to tell our stories once we have, a real, have had a real chance to engage with what the outcome is. And when you look at the effect of this allele on obesity, what you can see here is that men on the left, women on the right, that generally women have higher BMI, and that the difference in BMI, given the three different genotypes, is more marked in women than it is in men. So there may be some sex-specific effects here as well. But what you can see is that individuals who um, have the non-variant homozygous genotype GG have the lowest BMI levels, whereas those who have one of the variant alleles, which is the A allele, have higher BMI, and those who have two variant alleles, the AA, have on average the highest BMI. But what you can see in these violent plots is that individually they're not predictive, but as a group you can see that there's a strong um, association. So this brought novel insight into um, what we understand about obesity, the fact that this particular gene is important in how we use and store fat in our cells. So that's that example. Then this is the second example um, where it is a very large study. And in this case, it's looking at uh, blood pressure. So again, it is a continuous variable. Um, but later on, they use the data that that they've um, generated and the conclusions that they've reached to actually go and draw conclusions about hypertension. So this, you can see all the authors there. And the, the study design was that they were looking at genetic association with three measures of blood pressure, systolic and di diastolic blood pressure and pulse pressure. So you can imagine that um, some variants may be associated only with systolic blood pressure and others only with pulse pressure but that others may be associated with all three of those measures. Um, so we know that blood pressure is heritable 
and a modifiable driver of risk for stroke coronary artery disease. So it's a really important thing to look at because high blood pressure is a risk factor for cardiometabolic disease. Um, so when they started the study, um, they had about 120 loci or SNPs that had already been associated with blood pressure. And these were normally common variants, meaning that they had high minor allele frequencies, but each of them had a very small effect on the phenotype. So this is just in a nutshell what the story was. So their discovery cohort had about 140,000 people from the UK Biobank. <clears throat> and each one of those people had at least two blood pressure me measurements at different times. What they did was their analysis was a single variant linear regression model under an additive um, inheritance model. And what they did was that they um, did imputation before they did their association study. So they were able, after imputation, to have almost 10 million single nucleotide variants with a minor allele frequency of greater than uh, 10%. So um, the peak cutoff value that they used was 10 to the minus 6. And um, when they did a replication study, they had 240 loci that were associated. They then did some replication using two large blood pressure consortia. And they went back to using their criterion of genome-wide association study when they did their meta-analysis. So um, there they would say that it had to reach a p-value of less than 5 times 10 to the minus 8. But sometimes when they looked at replicating previous associations, they would use a much um, less significant p-value. So if you look on the right-hand side in terms of the um, results, you will see that there were 107 loci that were validated at genome-wide um, significance and that, that there were 32 novel associations among them, um, 75 had been found in the other studies on blood pressure and 53 out of the 75 were validated for the first time. So, um, so this is very important as well. And if you look at the associations, um, some of them were primarily with systolic blood pressure, others with diastolic blood pressure and others with pulse pressure. So altogether, the validated loci increased the percentage of the trach variants explained by genetics by about 1%. So it went from 2.56 um, to 3.56% of systolic blood pressure that could be explained by all these 107 associations. So again, it just makes the point that um, each one individually contributes very little, but even as a group, they still contribute modestly <clears throat> to blood pressure. But I think um, what I found really interesting was when they used that 107 loci to actually build genetic risk scores. So the way you build a risk score is that you say, at each one of those markers, does a person have zero, one, or two copies of the allele that is associated with the trait? And by doing this, you can look at the distribution in the population of people who have a low, high, or medium genetic risk score. And as you can see in that graph on the right, the black is actually reflecting the population. So what they did was that they put individuals into quintiles. So they, first of all, they only looked at people who were over the age of 50 years, because we know that blood pressure is very much associated with age as well. And if you take your 50-year-old pluses and you put them into five groups from the lowest genetic risk score to the highest genetic risk score, knowing that most people had a sort of medium risk score, what could you say about their odds ratio of having hypertension? Um, so now what they've done is that they said, you know, we, we did our genetic risk scores by looking at blood pressure, but now we're going to look at people with hypertension. So that is where you look at the blue line on the graph and where the people with the lowest at the lowest quintile who have the lowest genetic risk score will have an odds ratio of one but if you then look at people in the fifth quintile with the highest genetic risk score their odds for having hypertension is increased by almost 2.5 times i think it's 2.3 so i'm hoping that you can sort of 
interpret that because I think that is what is really interesting is that what you can say then is a combined genetic risk score can influence or, or predict your blood pressure or your likelihood of ha having hypertension somewhat because your odds ratio or your risk of getting hypertension would be much elevated. So this is now being used, um, genetic risk scores are now being used in some sort of public health scenarios. For instance, you can do the same with breast cancer and stratify your population in terms of either quintiles or percentages um, of women at the lowest to the highest risk. And then for those who are at the highest genetic risk of getting breast cancer, you could implement um, population screening at a much earlier age. So then if we go to the next slide, um, this is really saying, you know, we've looked at your polygenic or your genetic risk score for blood pressure, but how does that correlate with your risk for cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease and stroke? So what you see here is that um, it's the very same kind of graph. People are still in their quintiles according to their genetic risk for higher blood pressure. And when you then look at the blue line, which is cardiovascular disease, or you look at the red dotted line, which is um, coronary artery disease or stroke in the yellow, you can see that individuals who are in the fifth quintile of having the highest genetic risk score, that their odds ratio of, of getting any of those conditions is much higher. But it's not the same magnitude as for the hypertension, because here we're going from an odds ratio of one in the lowest quintile to an odds ratio of about 1.35 in the highest quintile. So this is the last paper, um, and this was published in December last year, and it's just really um, has this amazing picture here um, showing us at how many different levels we can look at any particular trait or disease, and that in GWAS studies, what we're really looking at is um, that band second from the bottom. But just how complicated this whole story is in terms of um, pathways, um, genes that work together, but not only looking at the genes, but looking at molecular phenotypes, which sometimes are measurable or not, um, looking at integrated physiology, eventually at organs and individuals. So you can see how complex it would be going from a genetic association to really understanding a phenotypic outcome, that it is so much more than just simply your genetic risk score. Many other things factor into that and influence other levels of the biology, which impacts health at the end of the day. So I think that was my last um, example. And then just the conclusions from the session today is, um, you know, understanding that complex multifactorial traits are in fact complex and that um, complex diseases, sometimes referred to as non-communicable diseases, are caused by both genetic risk variance and environmental effects. So you can see how we can start through GWAS studies to identify variants that we can use to predict genetic risk, but that that is not enough on an individual level to um, predict your likelihood of getting, um, whether it be diabetes or stroke or something else, that you also need to take into consideration environmental risk facts, factors, which may be things like smoking, diet, exercise, a whole lot of different things. So in general, in terms of complex traits, if the heritability is high, it should be possible to find genetic risk variants that explain a fair amount of the phenotypic variation. But I think you understand what goes into that mix. And um, just to remember again that the associated markers that we find are not good predictors for the phenotype on an individual level, that it's normally that we're looking at it at a group level. Um, the two main study designs, case control, if you're looking at a particular disease or a quantitative trait, if it's a continuous variable. And then um, just the three points that remember that genetic association is not usually disease causality. But you have to look out, in the case of the Samoan example, the variant that they found was, in fact, causal of the phenotype. And um, so linkage disequilibrium in different populations will um, give you clues about how close or how far the causal variants might be. And then hopefully from GWAS studies, we 
we eventually get some really interesting biological insights. So I think that is all that I have to say now. I'm just looking at the questions on the left-hand side. Um, thanks, Sean. So what are the main things that should be taken into consideration in the design of, for example, an array specific to an African population? So I think, you know, the most important thing is that the variance on the array should have quite a high minor allele frequency in many African populations. And you should also look at linkage disequilibrium. So when the team designed the H3 Africa array, they did a lot of checks and balances to make sure that they identified um, as many LD blocks or haplotype blocks as possible. And they checked this throughout the whole genome. And then they also made sure that the variants that they chose as the tag SNPs for individual LD blocks had a reasonable minor allele frequency. So I think those were the two most important things. But I think at some stage you might actually get a lecture on how the array was designed because there were some limitations right in the beginning when the array was designed in terms of Illumina bead pools. But one of the kind of interesting features about the H3 Africa array is it was also enriched for variants that had previously been shown to be associated with disease. So we can do replication studies using the outcome of the array. Um, they also chose variants of pharmacogenomic interest um, and, and some that had been identified in cancer and so on. So I think really all in all, a very um, comprehensive array that should enable us to do a lot. Can one apply GWAS on exome sequence data? So if you're looking at exome sequence data, it's not truly a GWAS, because if you think about the exomes, that they only um, account for like 1.8% of the genome as a whole. So if your association with your disease is not with a variant inside a gene, you're not going to find the association by using exome sequence data. But if you are lucky and your variants that are associated with your disease are in your exome sequences, you can certainly do a genetic association study, but it wouldn't be a genome-wide association study. Then uh, Julius has asked, does the H3A imputation panel have a population bias given the diversity and different allele frequencies in African populations? So um, great question, Julius, because we know that um, variants that are common in one African population may be absent or rare in another African population. So again, when the team designed the H3 Africa array, they tried to get a good representation of populations across the whole of Africa, and then specifically to pick variants that were common in multiple African populations. But again, you know, you will get information once you have your data. So if you're working on a novel population that has never before been studied and you get your H3 Africa array data, the first thing you should do is look at the distribution of allele frequencies and then maybe look at um, possible differences in terms of other populations. So that's a really fun thing to do to see how common or how different your particular population is given other African populations. And on not just back to sample size computation, how do we select the varying minor allele values to be used? So Onocha here, um, there are various packages. One of them is called Quanto. And what you really have to do is draw a graph where you model, um, like you can start off by saying, my population size is 4,000 cases and 4,000 controls. Um, if I vary the minor allele frequency and I vary the effect sizes, you can actually build um, graphs to tell you where you will be 80% power power to see what kind of effect. So it's very important that you do this. So there definitely are rules. So check out some of those packages. I'm sure Sean um, and Samir can give you access to more, but one of them is called Quanto. But there are different ones that will tell you about this, the power given your sample size, because I'm assuming you have a finite yeah, I'll put, sample I'll put the link size. in the chat. Then Wisdom is asking about, oh, thanks very much, Sean. Um, then Wisdom is asking, in terms of family-based trio studies, if a sample size of 90 cases and 180 controls, enough to give a good power of detection. So Wisdom, again, it depends on um, 
what kind of effect size you're looking at. But family studies can be very powerful because if you have the phenotype only in your index case and not in your parents, um, you know, it's kind of interesting to see what combinations are in the child that are not present in either parent. So there are quite a few um, analyses approaches that are used specifically for family studies. I don't think any of those are in existing H3A pipelines, but it definitely would be worth reading around that a little bit and having a lot of discussions. Um, because as I say, families can be powerful, um, but the analysis does become a lot more difficult and complex to kind of tease out things. Because obviously in families, children will have 50% of the variation in each of their parents. Um, so how do you know when you're looking at something that's really associated with the phenotype and is not just something which is in that particular family? So it gets a little bit tricky. So I can't tell you how much power of wisdom you have to think about what you're trying to, to do and then look at these more complex um, analysis packages. Great, you're very welcome. I don't know if I've missed any questions, Sean or Samir. So there was a question uh, from Kevin. Is there an estimated size of the habitat block for the genomes of African populations? I'm not sure I understand that too clearly. So interestingly enough, um, when you read the Thousand Genomes paper, and I hope that all of you will read the Thousand Genomes paper, um, it does actually give you an average LD block um, per, I don't know, if, Okay. I think it's per population, Sean. So very clearly in that analysis, however they did it, so I think they do look at um, R square okay. values that would be between, average um, block size, yeah. markers, and then they can sort of estimate the size. Yeah, so they can actually work it out. Um, so, yeah. So Kevin's question now is how effective is imputation on African populations given the underrepresentation of African populations in both HapMap and 1,000 genome panels? So the good news, Kevin, is that we think that there are now over 4,000 African whole genomes that can be used as part of an imputation panel. So um, some groups have started doing imputation and when you, so in the world there are essentially two imputation services. So one of them is at the Sanger Center and if you use the Sanger Center you can say whether you want imputation to happen with everything that they've got or with an African panel that includes I think about 4,000 African whole genomes. That that is a very good panel for the H3 Africa array. So I think we're in much better shape now than we were two, three, four years ago. And then the other imputation services at Michigan, the University of Michigan, and um, what somebody who did an analysis found was that the imputation there was, was not quite as good as it was with the Sanger African panel. But I'm sure you'll be talking about that a lot in some of the other sessions. And Wisdom, yes, you will have access. And Oscar. <laughs> so you're thinking that, um, you know, will we build another H3 Africa chip or array uh, to capture more variation? I think time will tell. I think it, we discovered that it was a much bigger job than we had anticipated originally. Um, but if there is a really compelling reason why another array should be developed, it is certainly something that, that could be done. And, you know, one of the interesting questions people might ask is, you know, if you're working in West Africa, would you want a different array to people working, for example, in Southern Africa? And, um, you know, the arrays are becoming more flexible in that um, people have what they call, or Illumina has what they call bead pools. And maybe in the future there would be like a West African bead pool, a South African bead pool, a backbone bead pool, and they could actually mix it up in terms of what would best suit your particular study. Oh, great. Thanks, Samir. So there will be a proper proper lecture on imputation. I think it's a great conversation to have, and, and there's so many interesting things to learn. Great, Michelle. So I think, uh, let's just see if there's any more questions coming through. 
might not stop. <laughs> but uh, there aren't any pressing questions now. I think that's it. So I think thanks, uh, thanks again, Michelle. I think it was a, a very great, uh, interesting uh, lecture, and also stimulated some interesting questions and a good start to 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 this GWAS, uh, well, GWAS course and GWAS lecture series. Um, so if there isn't any other questions or comments, so there are questions. So in general, just answer this. So the, so you will have access to the lecture at some point. And we will also have, we will provide uh, access to the lecture recordings as well uh, in the future. So we will be in contact with you providing links to that.